All right, so today we're going to finish chapter one. So my, my policy on sapling is I have it due two days after we finish it in class. So I did have a due date of tomorrow, and so I moved it to, did I move it to, I, I moved it to Monday, okay? So um, I also, if, if we finish on a Wednesday on a chapter, I don't have it due on Friday night. No one wants to do homework on Friday night, so. Um, so the due date for sapling is Monday. It's a long assignment. If you haven't started it, you should get started on it. it I don't want you to get behind. Who thinks, uh, let's do a little show of hands. Who thinks that I should have a weekly due date for part portions of each chapter? Who thinks that? Oh, you like to have it all at once? Yeah. You, you, might not, you might not agree with that on Monday night at 10 when you start the assignment. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's talk about electronegativity and bond polarity. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a little bit, uh, we're going to finish the chapter. I'm going to put a problem up. I left my, my uh, USB drive at home, so we're not going to do eye clickers. We're just going to take a little vote in class. And I'm also going to do a demo for um, electron density. We'll try it and see how it works, okay? So let's talk about electronegativity and bond polarity. Um, we have nonpolar covalent bonds where we have the bonding electrons shared equally. And this happens when we have both atoms of the same electronegativity. So EC's example of this is hydrogen, which we can draw with two dots for the shared electron pair, or we can draw with a line, which also signifies a shared electron pair. And then we have polar covalent on the next page. So polar covalent bonding electrons are shared unequally, two atoms with different electronegativities. So a good example of that is hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen electronegativity is 2.2. Chlorine 3.2. All right, so we can see that we have a polarized bond. The electrons are going to be flowing towards the chlorine. And so we can use partial positive for the hydrogen. And the chlorine will have a partial negative charge. So that's one way of designating the polarity of that bond. Um, if we drew, if we drew hydro, hydrochloric acid with electron pairs like we did with hydrogen, the electron pairs would actually be closer to the chlorine. So it would kind of look like that. Again, we have our partial positive and our partial negative charge. And that shared electron pair, because chlorine has a very strong pull of on electrons, the shared electron pair is going to be closer to the chlorine. And another way we can write this, uh, we can also write uh, with, a, with a bond dipole. All right, so here's hydrochloric acid. And we can use uh, a vector. The head of the arrow is the negatively charged portion. And the tail of the arrow is the partial positively charged portion. So that's, a, that, that's another way to signify it the polarity of that um, bond. The higher the electronegativity, the greater the attraction for electrons. That's no news to anybody in this room, I hope. And so here's some examples here. Here's our classic G-chem example between so sodium and chlorine. We have metal and a non-metal. Metal 0 0.9 for sodium electronegativity. And this would be our non-metal. 3.2, and so we would definitely say that that's an ionic bond between the sodium and the chlorine. Sodium's going to donate, a, a, a completely donate its a, a single electron to chlorine. So we would have an ionic bond here. What about bonds between carbon and hydrogen? We use those a lot in organic chemistry, of course. 
2.5 electronegativity for carbon for hydrogen 2.2. So we have a little bit of an electron. Uh, we we have a little bit of an electronegativity difference, but it's not very large. And um, we it, a, a bond between carbon and hydrogen is considered to be nonpolar. So we we definitely do have a little bit of something going on here, but we consider this is a covalent bond that's considered nonpolar. Now we're going to see examples of, of, of compounds where there's a, another functional group attached to the carbon which will make it polar, but just for a simple hydrocarbon, something with just carbons and hydrogens, um, it's considered to be nonpolar and we're going to, we're going to be ignoring the, this, the tiny polarity of a carbon-hydrogen bond because it behaves as a nonpolar compound. The rest of these are covalent bonds of high, po high polarity. All right, and so a lot of the compounds that we're dealing with fall into this category. Most of the compounds we're dealing with fall into this category. So recall if the electronegativity difference is greater than about 1.8, the electron will be tr transferred completely and you will have an ionic bond and that's what's happened here. Electronegativity difference is greater than one po about 1.8. There is an important exception to this rule. So uh, exception here sort of on the borderline compound and that would be hydrofluoric acid. So we're right at 1.8 here. So this is 2.2 for hydrogen and for fluorine 4.0. So this is right on the border here but it is not ionic. So it does not have any properties of an ionic compound. So this is really kind of our exception that's right on the borderline. Most things where it's great, where it's 1.8 or greater are going to be ionic compounds and electrons are going to be transferred completely. All right, so understanding bond polarity is critical to your understanding of organic chemistry. This is a really important uh, aspect of organic chemistry. And one of the things that we can do is we can draw electrostatic potential maps to show where the electron distribution is in a molecule. Now everybody here, except if you're a transfer student, you've used um, Spartan and you can actually draw these in Spartan really quickly. It's kind of interesting to do because you can see what these look like. If you're interested in doing that, um, I can post the, most of you know how to do it, but I can certainly post the, the uh, directions on how to do that. So electrostatic potential map. So we have a color gradation. This, one, this is going to show up better on your sheet than it does on the transparency, but we have red and everywhere where you have red is a very electron rich. Electron rich, blue is electron poor. Okay, so right here, electron rich red. partial negative or full negative parts of the molecule. And the blue is electron poor. Partial positive or full positive parts of a molecule. And so uh, when we have red parts of the molecule, they're going to attract um, positively charged particles. And when we have the blue parts of the molecule, they're going to attract negatively charged particles. So 
So here's some examples of some things that I drew in Spartan that we can look at. You can see the molecule kind of hidden underneath. This here is methyl chloride. So I'll draw it right here using dashes and wedges so you can, it kind of correlates with, with what we're showing here. One of the hydrogens is coming forward. Uh, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so we have partial positive charge on the carbon, partial negative charge on the chlorine, and you can see that we have uh, the red is on the top here. That's for the, the partial positive charge on chlorine, and down here on carbon it's blue. Right next to that is hydrofluoric acid. Fluorine definitely much more electronegative than hydrogen, so we have a partial negative charge on fluorine, partial positive charge on the hydrogen. And so where we have the partial positive charge, that's going to be blue. And where we have the partial negative, that's going to be red. This is ammonia. So drawing it with dashes and wedges to correspond with it, the, the orientation that it's shown in right here. So we have this hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and the lone pair. And you can see that really what we're looking at is a picture of the molecule. And so um, we can't see lone pairs. When you draw things in Spartan with the, and, and we draw it like that, you're not seeing lone pairs. We can't see lone pairs when we look at a molecule. If we take a crystal structure of a molecule, we can't see the lone pairs. So, um, so now you can see here, this is why when we're talking about the shape, we don't want to call that tetrahedral, that the electrons have a tetrahedral orientation, but the actual shape is, is trigonal pyramid here. And so you can see that's exactly what it would look like. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about molecular shape. This is a carbanion here. So very similar to ammonia. So this is a negatively charged carbon. And what we can see here is that the nitrogen here, electron rich, it's red. Um, the carbon here, electron rich. And here the fluorine, very, very red here, very electron rich. And then here's some, a few more examples here. Here's water. So we've got um, partial negative charge oxygen. All right, because the, the oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Both hydrogens are partial positive. And so you can see exactly um, that in the picture. We got the blue here for the partial positive. We got the red for the partial negative. This here is hydroxide ion. Did not print very well. So there's hydroxide ion. You can see uh, underneath that kind of weird printing that it did there, you can see electron deficient hydrogen. And electron rich oxygen. And, and this next one, this is hydronium ion. This is going to throw you off a little bit. So sometimes that formal charge can deceive us a little bit. And here would be a good example. And we know polarity for each of these bonds. Okay, so this is going to throw you off a little bit. We know the bond is polarized. Each of these bonds is polarized in this direction towards oxygen. So even though the oxygen has a positive charge, that's not the electron deficient part of the molecule. The hydrogens are electron deficient. So sometimes the formal charge can throw you off a little bit. Uh, remember, the formal charge on oxygen just means that it has, it has one less electron to match the number of protons in the nucleus. Okay, but actually for hydronium ion, the hydrogens are electron deficient, not the oxygen.
Hydrogens are electron deficient, not oxygen. Okay, so that one kind of throws you off a little bit. I wanted to point that out. We're going to look at that again. <clears throat> we use hydronium ion a lot in this class. Questions on electrostatic potential maps? Anybody? Yes? For which one? How come it's what? Because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so we have the bond polarized this direction. Just like that. Just like hydronium ion. Okay, so that's, this would be an example of something that has, doesn't have a full negative, it has a partial negative charge. Right? Because of the polarity of each of those bonds. So nitrogen is going to be partial negative and each of the hydrogens are partial positive. Okay, more questions? Yes? Does the carbanion have a dipole or no? Or because then like it's non, like the bond is also non polar, so it does have that bone pair. Um, that is definitely has a, has, that, that definitely is a polar molecule. We'll talk about that coming up. That's the very last part of this chapter. All right, so um, a polar bond is a dipole. It has a negative end and a positive end. The size of the dipole is indicated by the dipole moment. I corrected it on my sheet. If you have a delta E on yours, could you cross out the delta? All right, so here's the formula for dipole moment, which we will use mu for to signify the units are Debye's. So capital D for Debye. D-E-B-Y-E. -E. All right, so what does this mean? Uh, the E is the magnitude of the charge. And, and, and D is, a, is an important factor that we very often forget about, and that is the distance between the two charges. All right, so that's going to explain some interesting things that we see here in this chart on the next page. Uh, I do not want you to memorize this chart, but I do want you to know some trends here. All right, so let's see some things we can predict. Uh, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, so we would expect a carbon-oxygen bond to have a larger dipole. Okay, because the charge is going to be larger. The charge difference between the two ends of the dipole is going to be larger. Carbon fluorine, 1.5 divides, definitely fluorine is really electronegative. Carbon chlorine, 1.56. Uh, carbon bromine, 1.48, 1.29. That's, that's, that's pretty close, right? Kind of surprising there. There's a big di electronegativity difference between fluorine and chlorine, and these are almost the same. Okay, and that has to do with this formula. It's the magnitude of the charge times the distance. A carbon-chlorine bond, although it has a smaller difference in charge, it has, there's, that's a longer bond. So the distance between those charges is larger. So here, let's draw this right here. We have, let's do uh, carbon-fluorine and let's do carbon-chlorine. All right, so um, definitely carbon 2.5, 2.5, fluorine is 4, I think chlorine is 3.5, we'll say approximately 3.5, okay, so the difference in electronegativity, so that, that delta, you'll see the formula for um, dipole moments sometimes written with a delta, but it doesn't match your book, so that's why we're taking it off. So we see a, a greater difference in charge here. This is smaller. However, this bond is a lot longer and it's the factor. It's the magnitude of the difference in the charge here, the magnitude of the charge times the distance. So that's why these guys have almost the same dipole, even though fluorine's a lot more electronegative than chlorine. 
All right, carbon hydrogen, really small. It does have a slight, but we're going to consider this nonpolar. Nit hydrogen, nitrogen, we expect that to be larger because um, nitrogen is more electronegative. Oxygen, hydrogen, definitely polar. What about this carbon oxygen? Notice we go from carbon oxygen here, 0.86 to buy, and now when we put a double bond there, it jumps up to 2.4. The electronegativity difference is the same. Right? So what is that all about? Why is it so much more polar? Yeah, that's well, but see that's going to that's going to get smaller here, right? He said double bonds are closer, but now that's getting this this factor would be smaller. So why do we have 2.5? And look at uh, carbon nitrogen. We go from 0.22 to 3.6. Look at that. And again, that's shorter. So why is that factor getting so large. It has to do with resonance structures that we've been drawing. So if you look at a um, carbon oxygen bond and let's compare that with a carbon double bonded to oxygen. So one of the things that we've been doing when we draw resonance structures is we, we would, one of the things we would do is we'd break this pi bond and we move the electrons over onto the more electronegative atom to draw a resonance structure that you wouldn't even consider, we'll leave this, uh, these other groups off, to draw a resonance structure that you wouldn't have even considered in when you were in general chemistry, but we said it's okay for carbon not to have an octet in a resonance structure. Okay, so we have the electronegativity difference, but we also have the hybrid here. Even though this is a minor resonance structure, it still plays a role in the hybrid. So this, this sort of, um, let me leave those off, this adds on. So we have partial negative here, we have partial positive here. That's the hybrid. And remember, the hybrid's the true structure. So um, we, don't, we not only have the electronegativity difference here, but we also have this minor resonance structure that we don't have when we have a carbon-oxygen single bond. Those two things are going to add together to make that bond much more polar. More polar even than a carbon-fluorine bond, okay? So it's a really large effect. So let's, let's write some of these things down here. Things you should know, notice, carbon-chlorine has a larger, yeah, it's actually larger. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Carbon-chlorine bond has a larger dipole than a carbon fluorine bond. Even though fluorine is more electronegative. So very surprising, would not have um, predicted that. And we explained why that is. Carbon-oxygen dipole is smaller than a carbon double bonded to oxygen. even though the carbon-oxygen double bond is shorter. And for both of these things, why? Remember, it's the magnitude of the charge difference times the distance. It is the magnitude of the charge difference times the distance. So once again, um, carbon fluorine has a greater, greater charge but um, is a shorter bond.
but it's a shorter bond than carbon chlorine. All right, questions on that chart? Anybody? All right, so in a, if we have a molecule with only one covalent bond, the dipole moment of the molecule is identical to the dipole moment of the bond. So hydrochloric acid, for example, there's only one bond there. So that bond dipole is going to match the dipole, overall dipole for the molecule since there's only one bond. Uh, when we have more than one covalent bond, it's going to, the dipole moment, which is the collective dipoles for every bond, is going to depend on the geometry. And so we need to know geometry if we're going to be able to figure that out. All right, so let's look at polarity of molecules together. So dipole moment, vector sum of all the bond dipoles in the molecule. Now, some of you had vectors, some of you haven't. So um, we're going to just, I'm going to show you a few patterns. I'm not actually going to have you adding vectors in three-dimensional space, but I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of things that we will commonly see. So some nonpolar molecules that have polar bonds. So definitely each of those carbon-oxygen double bonds is very polar. We saw how polar a carbon-oxygen double bond is. But we have two identical vectors in equal and opposite directions. And when we add those vectors, they cancel each other out. So vectors cancel. So the dipole moment for the molecule is zero Debye. So again, the Debye is the units. So uh, no overall dipole. Another molecule that has polar bonds and zero dipole is um, BF3, boron trifluoride. So here's, here's the polarity of each of these bonds. Again, the vectors cancel. So if you add any two, any two vectors, the resultant vector, which is what you get when you add those two, the resultant vector will be equal and opposite. The remaining vector. So dipole moment for this molecule is zero to buys. So therefore it is a nonpolar molecule even though it contains polar bonds. Let me show you what I mean by adding the vectors together. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take any two vectors here um, and then you put them head to tail. So I'm going to use this one. Let's see what this looks like. Add the vectors. I'll take uh, this one and I'm going to try to put it in the, the correct orientation here. So that's this bond right here. And I'm going to put that head to tail. I'm going to use this other one right here. So I'm attempting as well as I can with this bright light shining in my eyes to put that in the same angle that it is there and the same length. So you put them head to tail and then you draw the resultant vector. So I'm just going to finish this triangle here. Where it's positive, it stays positive, and where we have the head of the vector, it stays, it stays that way. So that's the resultant vector. And can you see that that vector right here is equal and opposite that one? So they cancel each other out. So if you want to try this on your own, place uh, any two vectors head to tail. OK, 
keeping same magnitude and direction. And then you draw the resultant vector. All right, the third example here is a lot more difficult to see because we don't have everything in the plane here. So we have to add vectors in three dimensional space. Not as easy to do. So you're going to have to just take my word for it on this one. Vectors cancel in three dimensional space. If you add any three, once again, the resultant vector is equal and opposite the remaining vector. So once again, mu equals zero device, and therefore it's a nonpolar molecule. So this is carbon tetrachloride, and carbon tetrachloride is considered a nonpolar solvent. And so here's what it looks like. Um, since these are now, this is trigonal pyramid, they aren't going to cancel, uh, and they aren't going to cancel like they do when it's trigonal planar. So if you add this one, this one, and this one, you're going to get a vector that goes down, equal and opposite that one and they cancel each other out. Now if we replace one of these chlorines, any one of these chlorines with a different group like a hydrogen, then that will be polar. Okay? It's, this only happens when we have uh, four identical bonds in a tetrahedral molecule. They will all cancel each other out. But again, any one of those chlorines we replace with hydrogen and it will be polar. That's going to be a different molecule altogether, yes. All right, so some polar molecules. So we would expect the, the dipole to go this direction here. One polar bond. We're going to ignore carbon hydrogen bonds. They are considered to be nonpolar. Ammonia is a polar molecule. So if we have each of these bonds are certainly nitrogen's more electronegative, so they all go towards nitrogen like this. And if we add together three of them, the net dipole is going to kind of look something like this. The lone pair does play a part, but we don't really have a value for that, um, actually that. Um, so it's something to, to, to keep in mind, but it's not something that we're going to worry about the lone pairs when we're trying to figure out um, dipoles for a molecule. Over here, we, let, let's see what we have. We have carbon chlorine this direction, carbon chlorine this direction. And so we get a net dipole that looks something like this. Oh, that line's a little long there, but that's our net dipole. You may want to try that doing vectors. You can do that on your own. So for this one, three polar bonds. All dipoles reinforce. It means they add together. For this particular molecule, the dipole moment is 1.47 Debye's. You do not need to memorize that number. So compare this with the 
a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. which is 1.31 device. So you can see that they are adding together to make that 1.47 because that number is larger than it would be if you just had a single nitrogen-hydrogen bond. For, uh, for this one here, dipole moment for the molecule is 1.60 device. Compare with the carbon chlorine bond dipole and that's 1.56 device. So they are adding together to make a resultant vector that's a little bit larger than the two, two vectors there. All right, questions on polarity of molecules? Yes? Bond the carbon oxygen increase. Okay. Okay, so everybody here, would you ask, you wanted to know why um, the carbon oxygen double bond is larger, has a larger dipole than the carbon oxygen single bond? And that's because we have two factors for the carbon oxygen single bond. One factor for the carbon oxygen single bond, and that's just the difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the oxygen. Carbon double bond, we actually have, we have that same difference in electronegativity and we also have a hybrid structure that we can draw because we can move these electrons onto oxygen. So you see that carbon has a positive charge on it in that resonance structure. So in the hybrid, we have a partial positive. So this polarity adds to the electronegativity difference. So it's the two things together and it's a really important factor. All right, so let's put our um, practice problem up. I'm going to let you look at it and then we'll vote. Since we can't vote with our clickers, we will vote with our, just raise your hand, right? Or maybe you can. So um, I took this off of midterm one last year and it's just one, this was a multi-step question. This is the step, this is a, one of the questions that's pertaining to what we just talked about today. So we have this molecule here. And there's a lot of parts to this problem. We talk about, oh, you know, I have you label different bonds. And so a complicated molecule, more complicated than you've seen. But we can still, I could point to any bond in this molecule and you'd be able to tell me what kind of bond that is and what electrons are, and what orbitals are used to make that bond. So like, let's just do that right now. This one, for example, we could do that with any of them. What about that bond there? That's a bond between two carbons. It's a sigma bond. So you can, you're now in a position where you could take a really complicated molecule and you could do that. Uh, it's a sigma bond. We have overlap of, wow, that's an sp carbon, a carbon sp. And this bond over here, that's tetrahedral carbon, so it's a carbon sp3. Right? And we could, we could label the geometry about this bond here, this carbon-carbon-nitrogen bond. It's tetrahedral, right? So bond angles of about 109.5. So we've really actually come a long way in this chapter. All right, so now um, which bond is the most polar in this molecule? Use partial positive and partial negative to indicate the polarity of this bond. So what do you think? So I put this problem on the test last, uh, last year and barely anybody got it right. So that's why it's up here. So I wanted us to be able to discuss it. So which bond is the most polar in this molecule? So I'm hearing CO double bond. Is there anything else we want to consider? NH? That's a polar bond. What, if, what else? Hydroxyl's polar. Uh, what about, what else did I, you, you said? Carbon-nitrogen triple bond. Who votes carbon-nitrogen triple bond? Okay, that is the most polar bond in the molecule. Because we just, on this previous page, look at the polarity of that bond. It's, it's enormous. That's an extremely large dipole. 
Compare that to carbon fluorine, it's more than double. Okay, so look out for carbon oxygen, double bonds, carbon nitrogen, double bonds, carbon nitrogen, triple bonds. Look out for those in molecules. What? It's because of hybrid structure? Yeah. Yes. All right. Let's do a demo. I don't know if this is going to work. This is the first time trying it. But I, I got a lot of questions in office hours about what do you mean by electron density, you know? So um, it's back to this page here. You don't need to turn to that page, but um, by the way, I should have, when I was draw drawing these, um, this, I really shouldn't have shaded this in, right? To show phase, I guess I should have, I should have had this one not shaded in. Um, but this is uh, an sp3 orbital, that's what that is. So I had a lot of students asking, what is this right here? This is an sp3 orbital. And so um, we have the chlorine with the sp3 orbital. And we said electron density spread over a large area. So remember, to get this orbital shape, that's where the electron, uh, the, that's where the electron can be found in this shaded area. So we, if we, we don't know how the electron moves, but we know if we just took a snapshot every, you know, certain fraction of a second over a long period of time that 90% of the time the electron would be in these two areas. Okay, so that's what we know. So um, let's try the demo. I also brought, by the way, I also brought magnets. I'm trying to keep them away from my electronic stuff, but you can um, come and try these on the way out. So we got the, I have plus and minus on it so you can go over here and feel no attraction and then as you get closer you can start to feel them wanting to fly together. And then you can also flip it around and you can feel with electron electron repulsion they want to pull apart. It's kind of nice to, to see what that uh, feels like. So for electron density, I know this is not shaped like an orbital but it kind of gives you an idea and let's see, does that show up? All right, so I'm just going to fill um, that this one is my larger orbital. I know it's not shaped like an orbital. We're going to put some water in that. We're going to put some water in that one. All right. So this is a smaller orbital. This is a larger orbital. It, the shape is, you know, I don't have a plastic forming thing that I can make the nice shape there. But I'm going to take a drop of ink here and drop it in. And this one actually needs a little more water so it's about the same distance from the top. I'm going to put a single drop, um, and I'm not going to cheat here, so you guys that are close, one drop, one drop, okay? So that's like our single electron, right? And now I'm going to stir it up and you'll see. So our single electron, our one drop, let's stir this up. Is it showing up? Okay. Okay, there, so it's spread over a larger space, right? So if you took a, just a segment of the space, you're less likely to find electron density in that little segment over here, has smaller space, and hopefully that's looking darker. Is it looking darker? Yeah. See the difference? So definitely more electron density here. Greater electron density. So when the S orbital comes in to overlap, when it's overlapping here, it's overlapping with more electron density when it comes in overlaps than it is over here. All right, questions? Anybody? So that's what I mean by that. All right, so are you ready to start? Are you ready to start chapter two? All right. Acids and bases. We're going to start with the basics. This is going to this is going to very closely match GChem for a little while, and then we're going to kind of depart from GChem in this chapter. We do things a little bit differently. We don't do titrations. We don't do buffers in this class. So I'm so sorry to disappoint you on that. All right. So let's do. Um, Bronsted Lowry acids and bases. Bronsted acid, a species that donates a proton. Bronsted base, a species that accepts a proton. A Bronsted Lowry acid must contain a hydrogen atom. The symbol HA is used for general Bronsted Lowry acid. Um, a Bronsted Lowry base must be able to form a bond to a proton because a proton has no electrons. A base must contain an available electron pair. Got to be a pair that can easily donate to form a new bond. 
So lone pairs, common, or electron pairs and pi bonds. Those are more unusual. We'll see those coming up. Not too much in this chapter. In a bronsted acid base reaction, the proton is transferred from the acid to the base to get the products that are the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. Now when we do acid base reactions in, in OCHEM, we use arrow pushing, curvy arrows. All right, so remember the tail of the arrow always begins at electron pair such as non-bonding electrons or a covalent bond and the head points to where that electron pair moves. So here's our base. The arrow's coming from the oxygen. The electron rich comes from electron rich. It's going to grab this hydrogen and then we're going to break the nitrogen-hydrogen bond. So we use curvy arrows for this. So that's something that's new. So when you, get, when you start drawing these curvy arrows a lot, it's going to look like our definition, I don't know, I don't think of a Bronsted base as a species that accepts a proton. I think of a Bronsted base as a species that grabs a proton, okay? Because that's what it looks like when we draw the arrows. All right, so in GCHEM you might have seen arrows and the arrow would come from the hydrogen and move it over to there. We don't do that. We move around electrons, not atoms. So that's what that would look like. So here's our um, acid and base. And this is our conjugate base and our conjugate acid. So notice we have an acid on one side of the acid on each side of the equation. One acid and one base. So we start with an acid and a base, we end with an acid and a base. And we look for our conjugate pairs. So here's our conjugate pair. We look for pairs that have, are interconverted by gain or loss of a proton. So that's a conjugate pair. And then over here, this is a conjugate pair. Conjugate pair, species interconverted by gain or loss of a proton. by gain or loss of a proton. How do we know which one's the acid and which one's the base? We look for um, something that is changed just by one hydrogen. So we have ammonia, ammonium ion here and that clearly the difference here is that we've, we've lost a hydrogen going from here to here. So that's a conjugate pair. The one that has the extra proton is the acid and likewise here hydroxide and water. This one has the extra proton, so that's the acid. We have one on each side of the equation. All right, so um, I just want to say a couple things here. Curved arrows. Show the movement of electrons, not atoms. All right, so this is always going to look like this where we have our base grabbing a proton from an acid. So arrow comes from the lone pair, grabs the proton, and we break the uh, hydrogen acid bond, the HA bond. So here's an example where the arrow comes from a lone pair. And over here, the second arrow, the arrow comes from a covalent bond. And that's the two types we're going to see. Arrow comes from a covalent bond. And so we, so we, we don't want to do it this way. If you do it this way, you'll get no points. And arrow pushing, it's worth spending the time now to learn arrow pushing really well because we use it all year long, all year long from start to finish. So not this. 
That works in conveying that, okay, that hydrogen's moving over there, but we don't move atoms with curvy arrows, we move electrons. So let's put a big X through that. That's a perfect stop, stopping point. We'll stop right there. We'll continue this on Monday. I hope you guys have a great weekend.